you are listening to the podcast That's Life in Sweden, or as we say in Swedish, Sonti Livet i Sverige, with me, your host, Lisa Osimeki. It is a privilege to welcome Jane Caro, a well-known and recognized Australian social commentator with a low boredom threshold level, according to her publisher, Pan Macmillan, meaning she has many careers, writer, author, award-winning journalist, broadcaster, documentary maker and feminist. And I have not even touched on her amazing background and achievements. Welcome Jane to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Lisa. It's, I'm very happy to be talking to you. Your background is incredibly fascinating. And as mentioned, you are well recognized in Australia, especially for openly speaking your mind on real issues that many women especially are afraid to voice publicly. Can you share what you think is the reason or reasons for your courage to speak so openly on things that really matter? Yeah, a, a lot of people ask me about that. Um, and I think part of it is I don't feel like it's got a lot to do with courage because I think courage demands that you have to be afraid of something and then you overcome it. And I'm not afraid to speak my mind. Um, and I think I have to give credit for that to my upbringing. Um, where, I mean, I'm the eldest of four children. Both my parents were um, very um, intellectual, engaged, um, interesting people. They still are. They're 91 and nearly 92 and mm -hmm. um, still love a good political discussion. Um, and we were brought up around a noisy dining table where we were expected to have opinions about things. Mm -hmm. We were expected to voice them. And we didn't have to agree with our parents. But if we made a different point of view, um, we had to back it up. We had to have uh, good logical reasons as to why we thought what we thought. Mm. And I think that kind of, you know, when I'd go to friends' houses, um, often the dining tables were very quiet or the talk was very superficial and conflict was something that was avoided at all costs. Well, it wasn't in my household. We liked a bit of drama and a bit of argy-bargy and a bit of, you know, slamming the table about a um, particular uh, point of view. Um, and so I guess I was brought up not to be afraid of that, to recognise that you can have a robust discussion and maintain mm. a, a good, even loving relationship with someone you disagree with. Um, my rule of thumb is always uh, you can be as robust as you like about the issue that you're discussing, but never play the person, never be personally insulting and never hate the person you disagree with. Um you know, disagreement is important. I mean, I can despise an opinion. There are plenty of opinions I do despise, particularly if they're self-serving or prejudiced or bigoted. Mm. But even so, I try to remember, don't always succeed, I try to remember that, you know, it's a human being voicing that opinion, a complicated human being. Mm. Now, you have written about many burning and relevant issues that touch us all. And you most recently wrote a brilliant piece on the cold hatred of anti-Semitism that was published on Twitter most recently on the 7th of July. Mm. So what do you believe is the reason for the growing racism that is happening and not only in Australia, but also here in Europe? And in America too. And um, in America. Horrifying. Mm. Yeah, horrifyingly in America. Um, well, I, par I think a lot of it is to do with fear. I think um, we are facing very wicked problems um, right across the world. And the, 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 major, the biggest one of these is climate change, which a lot of people are still desperately trying to deny. That feels like such an existential and huge problem. Mm. And I think when that happens, people turn to... They look for a simple um, 
explanation, a group to blame, not necessarily for climate change, which often those people who indulge in bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism, et cetera, um, deny. They, they just say it's a conspiracy, you know, and a, a mm. hoax and all that nonsense. But what they do is desperately, but they still have the anxiety. They still have the fear. They still get that we're in very, very dangerous times. And I think that the simplest thing for people to do is to direct their fear, which quickly turns into anger, um, particularly in patriarchy, particularly amongst men who, after all, are often they're traditionally and conservatively raised. Um, the default emotion is anger. Mm. So they will go to anger and then they direct that anger against a particular group because there's something perhaps satisfying um, in a weird way to say, see, if we just fix that group of assholes over there, then all our problems will be solved. And uh, that is being exploited ruthlessly, mm. unfortunately, by populists like Donald Trump, uh, like some European uh, leaders, um, what's his name, Orban comes to mind, and quite a few others, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, um, in Australia, we have our populists. We had a, a prime minister, thank goodness we've just gotten rid of him, who um, was very keen on the whole populist idea. Boris Johnson is another one. Um, and they exploit this. Um, they exploit the need people have for a simple answer and for someone to blame. And I think that's one of the reasons that misogyny, that racism, that anti-Semitism, that homophobia... Um, the ghastly trans, the attack on trans people that goes on at the moment are all um, on the rise. Hmm. So how do you think we can prevent the spreading of hatred that seems to be taking root in our society, specif specifically using social media as a platform they hide behind? And how can we silence or do you think we should leave the haters alone in the name of freedom of speech? No, I don't think that hate speech is ever um, acceptable. Um, I'm not quite sure how you shut it down, though, um, because even if, um, and I mean, I've just gone from Twitter to threads, well, I'm still on Twitter as well, um, and threads does seem to be a bit more polite and a bit nicer and a bit more um, less kind of um, of a cesspit than Twitter under Elon Musk was becoming, but... Um, they go to the dark web. They go to, um, you know, all sorts of other websites that will um, allow them to gather and spew their bile, unfortunately. I do think that certain governments probably pay, I mean, we know this, pay bots to try to intimidate, bully and shut people down. Um, uh, I think I think the only thing people of goodwill can do is refuse to be shut down. Mm. When we allow ourselves to be silenced, I mean, why are they trying so hard to silence us? Because they know that those contrary voices are powerful and important. So sometimes it can feel like you're yelling into the wind and that nobody's hearing you. But my belief is if that were true, you would not be getting trolled and insulted and the hate speech and all that kind of stuff mm. that so many people get on social media. So in a weird way, the attacks are proof positive that you need to keep speaking, that what you're saying is getting through and it is frightening them and that's why they're trying to shut you up. Mm. So what we have to do, we have to keep speaking. We have to keep speaking truth to power. We have to keep being kind. We have to keep demonstrating, modelling how to be a decent human being, why democracy matters, why, um, you know, uh, Decent free speech matters. That means you can have a different opinion from me. You can express it robustly, mm -hmm. but don't attack me, the person or my race or my gender or my sexual orientation. Um, and, you know, I think those people who are doing that are more important than perhaps they realise. Mm. And, of course, I'm thinking this comes back to your background and upbringing as well. Oh, Oh, yes, I was very definitely taught if you see injustice, you must speak against it. If you see something that is unfair and wrong, you must speak up about it. That is your obligation. I was really taught, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very privileged white woman. You know, I come from a family where my father was very successful in business, so we had enough money. You know, we got an excellent public school education in um, 
uh, Australia. We um, all went to university. You know, we, we're privileged people. And privilege gives you a buffer of safety and comfort. And I was taught from a very early age that my obligation for being privileged was not to try and gather more privilege or to hang on to every little privilege that I had, but in fact to do the opposite, to use my privilege to try and help other people get more privileged and be safer, to actually, I had an obligation I owed because I was born privileged. I didn't do anything mm. to be privileged. Mm. Mm. I got born into the lucky sperm club, you know. Um, therefore, it is my obligation to use that privilege to speak up to speak up against injustice and inequality and unfairness. I don't always manage to do it. I can get lazy. I can get overwhelmed, you know, yep. all that kind of stuff. Yep. I'm a human being. But I was brought up to think that was my obligation. Mm. You refer yourself to as an out and proud feminist. Mm. What do you mean by being a feminist? I mean someone, well, in fact, my definition of feminism changed a, a few years ago um, because of reading a book. I used to believe that it meant that, you know, the equality between the sexes, uh, the rights of women to determine their own lives and to aspire to whatever it is they wanted, simple straightforward definition of feminism. But then I read a book by an Australian um, author and philosopher called Hugh Mackay, which is called What Makes Us Tick. And in it, he lists the 10 uh, desires above Maslow's hierarchy of needs that need to be met to make a satisfying life. And he says that they're in no particular order in his book, apart from the first one, which he says is the most important. And he lists that as the desire to be taken seriously. And when I read that, I had an epiphany and I realised that that was what my feminism was about. I believe that feminism is the centuries, millennia old probably, fight by half the human race to get taken seriously by the other half, um, to be... that that they recognise that our view of the world, our perspective on things, the experiences we have, um, the, the way our history, the way we've been treated, um, what our biology lays us open to often, um, you know, is a, 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 as valid, important and serious a perspective as theirs. For so long, women's lives have either been completely ignored or trivialised. Um, or joked about, or minimised. I mean, we don't even get, me we haven't had medical science tested on female bodies. We haven't, you know, um, seat belts are unsafe for women because they used a, a um, you know, um, smaller version of the male dummy for the shock tests until very recently. Um, we've been so often totally ignored. Women are more likely to die of heart attacks because, they don't know, they never worried about our symptoms being different. So that's a refusal to take us seriously. That's a refusal to think that our life matters as much as their life. The increasing poverty of women as they age, um, this is a huge problem in Australia. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but in Australia it's enormous. Fastest growing group amongst the homeless in one of the most prosperous countries in the world are women over 55. Um, this is a refusal to take us seriously for our whole lives. Our right to earn an income, our right to have a secure old age is simply not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. But don't you think women has a part in that, that they're not taken seriously? Well, that's the thing about grooming. Um, you know, it's like saying, don't you think the poor have a part in being poor because they haven't taken hold of their life? Um, yes, to look from the outside and judge, maybe it looks that way. But actually, if you were living that life, if mm. you were brought up to think that you were lesser from the minute you were born, I often say that, you know, um, 2,000 years of people being disappointed when you are born isn't overcome in a few decades because that's what happened when girls were born. Mm -hmm. um, until relatively recently, that kind of stuff is hugely impactful. That's why they do it. Mm -hmm. They do it because it minimises us. It makes us smaller. And the thing about misogyny and sexism is it's not just something that men do to women mm -hmm. or even that women do to other women. It's something we do to ourselves. Internalised misogyny is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And you become gatekeepers. Yes, and you—that um, uh, is becoming amongst my 
cohort in Australia less so. We, we had a big thing happen in our last federal election, not simply that we managed to get rid of the absolute worst prime minister I think we've ever had, um, who was a evangelical right-wing populist nut job, but um, also the part the votes for the two main parties fell right across the board, more mm. for the Conservative Party than the Labor Party. But what we did get was we got eleven women independent candidates got into our parliament. Eleven. Unbelievable. And they were all came from community groups of women mm. who spoke up and got together and found candidates and said, we despise the way our governments are going. We want, and they all stood for the same three things, although they did not, I mean, they collaborated, but they were not in collusion. Um, the three things were respect mm. for women and their safety, action on climate change, urgent action on climate change, and transparency and integrity in government. Those were the three vital things. And what we saw was 11 conservative seats fall to those women who are now in the parliament. They're called the Teals. And that is a huge step forward. Australian women have had the vote since Federation in 1901. Mm. But I believe this is the first election in 2022 when women actually voted in their own interest for the first time. So the gatekeeping, it's stopping. We're actually working together to get the things that we believe matter and to change our country and hopefully seeing women doing similar things in the rest of the world. I still imagine that being a feminist in Australia is not embraced openly by the society. Uh, yeah, it is more and more. Um we certainly have a rump, uh, mostly on the conservative side of public politics who find it hard to call themselves a feminist out loud. But uh, you'll find that every minister, every female minister in the Labor government says so without any embarrassment, and most of the men do too. Um, I think Australia has actually um, become quite open about feminism, and I think perhaps that's because we did come from such an overtly macho culture, mm -hmm. and so the fight back has been in some ways easier because the sexism was so clear, you know, we could sort of point to it and go, uh, sorry, look at that. Um, whereas in some perhaps more older cultures, more sophisticated cultures, there was a bit more of the smiling assassin by the sexist blokes. <laughs> so they said the right things out their mouths yeah. but behaved very bad. And that's much harder to call out. It's much harder to deal with. So, no, my experience of being a feminist in Australia is that's not nearly as controversial as the fact that I'm also an advocate for public education. In Australia, that's a radical position um, because we have publicly funded private schools here, which is disgraceful. Um, and uh, we have a real two-tiered class-based education system, which no one wants to look at. Now, that's the radical position in Australia. A feminist has become somewhat less of a, um, a, a kind of... Uh, out their position. Mm. I'm just thinking about when you mention men who are fem feminists. I mean, here in Sweden, you know, it's very open. We, we you know, and when I'm thinking about feminists, I'm actually thinking about the the rights that I just would take uh, as given, if you like. For example, mm. Mm. that both parents had got parental uh, rights to be at home with their children, and that hasn't really infil infiltrated in Australia as yet. Certainly not, maybe in, in companies where you have a um, privileged position, if you like, but not necessarily if you work in, you know, in, uh, for example, hospitality. Do men get mm. paraten parental leave the same right. as women? Are they both being encouraged? Um, and, and once, you know, you, you, when we think about feminism and you talk about the divide that still kind of, we're not quite there yet. Um, mm, no, it, yeah, it's a step forward. But I'm thinking about the, the day to day life. Yeah, I think that's true. We, but we got infected with the nasty neoliberal virus yes. that infected uh, America, still infects America, 
um, and also Britain under Boris Johnson. And that meant that there was a kind of refusal by the government, the, 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 the Conservative Party here called the Liberal Party, which is a misnomer. Um, and they've been in power for the last decade. And so getting any kind of concessions through for women in terms of paid parental leave for both parents, et cetera, et cetera. We have got some, but it's paid at the minimum wage if you get the government one, and it's only for three months and um, three or four months, I think. And, yes, men very rarely take it. Um, they are supposed to be able to take it, but we need, as is uh, the case in Scandinavia and perhaps in Sweden too, uh, the use it or lose it clause where men are basically forced to take it. Mm. I think that would be um, a, a great improvement. And certainly there's activism going on here to improve our paid parental leave. We do have it, unlike America, which doesn't have it at all. Um, but yes, we have been hobbled by the neoliberal, everything you get or don't get is all your own fault philosophy, which unfortunately um, the people who've been in power for a decade follow. The current government is being very timid about it because, remember, we are the country that gave birth to Rupert Murdoch. So um, the Murdoch <laughs> papers are unfortunately very powerful here mm. and they are overt in their support for the conservative side of politics and they can cause all sorts of trouble. Mm. Um and so our politicians become timid in the face of the Murdoch press. Um, but I don't think it is courageous to say you're a feminist. That doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a kind of corporate neoliberal feminism that I think is masquerading in a mm. way mm. Um, a, a, as a feminist. Though I, 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 I do say, you know, there can be all sorts of feminists. I'm not here to, to police who's a good feminist or a bad one. But... Um, I think we have been terribly, terribly scarred by that neoliberal government and it's going to take it time for us to come back from that. But we've had, we had um, before the last election, we had a March for Justice right around Australia mm. of women, hundreds of thousands of women and male supporters marching against the then government, uh, particularly around a scandal about an alleged rape in Parliament House and uh, the way that the woman involved was treated and is still being treated. So there's a big head of steam up in the women in the in Australia, we're a bit sick of being treated and, patro you know, second class and patronised and batted on the head and given sops. We are absolutely agitating. And, of course, post-COVID, um, like the rest of the world, we've got more jobs than we have people to do them at the moment. So that puts women in much more of a position of power in terms of asking for much better conditions, flexible work, for example, Mm. Working from home has become a much bigger thing here and that, of course, has um, disproportionately helped both women and men, but women in particular if they have child-caring responsibilities. We've just seen a local council trying to mandate that their workers all come back to the office five days a week and their workers are in open rebellion. So, um, you know, I think things are rapidly changing. So how do you think that's going to change? This, you know, there's flexibility in workplaces. And I'm thinking, of course, about also single mothers. Yes, yes. And um, single mothers have been treated appallingly in Australia, absolutely appallingly, and demonised. Um, and um, that's one of the main reasons so many women end up in poverty in old age, because they've been single mothers and they've been unable to... Um, amass any superannuation or anything to take care of themselves as they get older. I think there is much more recognition that the system is absolutely weighted against women. There is certainly um, a lot of pushback about the family court here and uh, some of the ways that uh, women um you know, seeking divorce and particularly if the divorce is contested or there's any accusations of domestic violence or abuse is handled. Uh, so I think we are definitely, what, what I think has changed, and I can't say that this has changed anywhere else in the world because I don't know, but I know what I'm seeing here in Australia. I've been a feminist for as long as I can remember. My mother was a, a feminist and I was brought up that way. But I, when I think over the last 50 years mm. of my life, 
when I think of what Australian women thought their lives might be like 50 years ago, what they aspired to, what they allowed themselves to dream of and where they're at now, Mm. that's been an absolute revolution, the like of which I never thought I'd see. It's quite, quite extraordinary. Um, I believe Australian women are the best educated women in the world Um, and according to the World Economic Forum. So there is a huge talent there, you know, and an enormous amount of confidence that comes with that high education level. Mm. And I think that's what's changed. What hasn't changed is the attitudes of far too many men. So it's like women have changed beyond all recognition and men are still pretending the world's like it was 50 years ago. And it isn't. And that's why they're getting so angry. That's why they're getting so oppressive. That's why they're getting uh, so kind of, um, you know, um, uh, violent, uh, certainly in terms of abuse and anti-feminism. And you see the whole incel movement and the, um, you know, men's rights movement and all that stuff. It's because women have changed. We are demanding from men Mm. behaviour, equality, um, respect Mm. in ways I think that women have never asked before. That's not, we're not going back in our box. That's not going away. Mm. Not unless they hold guns at our heads. I think our system has advanced as far as women have. Hence, women in open rebellion. Hence, hundreds of thousands of women marching last year. Hence, the 11 teals, which really frightened the two, three major parties in this country. Indeed, that was at the federal election. In the New South Wales state election, for the first time in my life, I listened to two, the Premier and the opposition leader, who is now the Premier, he won and the um, the guy who was in the position lost, the Conservative guy lost, offering things to women, actually trying to outbid each other on things like childcare subsidies and um, that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the first time ever I've heard that. And that is because the Conservative now parties are now looking at polls, and this is really important, where they have lost the women's vote. The same thing's happening in America. Roe v. Wade has turbocharged that, of course. But, I mean, at least abortion is now legal right across Australia. So abortion rights are enshrined here, thank God. Um, they weren't until relatively recently. I've been fighting that fight all my life, but they are now. They are now. And, indeed, all of Australia now has a Labor government, every single state and the federal government except Tasmania. So there's been a real sea change in attitudes and the Teals really, really frightened the political system, the male system, because this was people power, uh, grassroots community groups getting together, almost all of them women, some men involved, but mostly women who drove this change. And I think women are now sitting there with their arms folded and saying, we're just not going to vote for you, bastards, until you give us the kinds of support Mm. that is available to women in other parts of the world and that we need to be able to bring up our children properly and to be able Mm. to participate fully in um, Australian life. And given that we're the best educated women in the world, what a waste it is not to utilise us properly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree entirely. What I'm finding is really interesting. You you mentioned is uh, I understand the childcare situation and the cost of childcare oh, in Australia ridiculous. is ridiculous, and it is. And I think that is something that is going to be so fascinating to see. Well, how are women going to be supported? Uh, look, I hope so, um, and I'm I have a slightly more hope while there are Labor governments in power across Australia than I would if we had Conservative governments in power across Australia. But unfortunately, 10 years of neoliberalism, and more than that, really, um, let's go back to John Howard, who came into power in the late 90s. Um, It's really been since then. 
uh, that has undermined what was a pretty good kind of attitude towards government support for people who needed it in this country. That we kind of did a mini Thatcherite thing where there was all this idea that, you know, people deserve what they got, you know, and um, you, you, there were lifters and leaners and people on welfare were um, leaners and those who went out and started small businesses were lifters, you know, all this judgmental claptrap yes. that's been going on mm. for a really long time. So dismantling that, changing that mindset is hard. Um, I do think that supporting mothers is still ridiculous. We've got the fourth most expensive childcare system in the world, and that's because we decided to put it out for for profit. So it is a for profit system, and most of it is privatised. And so then we give these childcare subsidies. We do the same with private schools. We give these subsidies to private suppliers. And unfortunately, as I keep pointing out, the public subsidy of private supply is always inflationary if you don't cap the fees. Yep. All it does is add more money to the private suppliers' pockets, and they then charge what they were going to charge anyway because they, they're business people. They charge what the market will bear. But our government seems incapable of realising this. So mm. both persuasions seems incapable of realising this. Now, we have done some really important good things recently. Again, most of it the Labor government. One is the um, NDIS, which is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, so mm. that people with disabilities now um, get supported by the government to help them get back into employment, to have secure housing, all those kinds of things. Well, we need to start looking wider than that. And, um, you know, particularly mothers, it's a tough gig being a mother in Australia and it's a tough gig being a single mother and it's a tough gig being a mother who goes out to paid work. But I think we're very well aware of that and there is a lot of agitating going on. It'll be hard to change because there are still far too many people who are, and our governments are terrified to increase taxation. Mm. And we're going to have to. We're going to have to. We can't, we can't pay for everything we've got to pay for. We can't fight climate change if we don't have, um, you know, public money with which to do it. Now, I am seeing a sea change with employers partly driven by the fact that they've got more jobs and they can get workers to fill them. And that always leads to um, changes. And one of the major changes I'm seeing, I happen to be judging some awards about it at the moment, so it's very fresh in my mind, is uh, the kinds of benefits they're offering for working parents, which includes male and female parental leave, which includes um, paid parental leave at more than the minimum wage, but at the wage at which they were earning previously. It includes important things like maintaining women's super payments or the carer's super payments for 12 months um, while their um, concentrating on parenting and maybe only coming back part-time, part mm. maintaining them at full-time wages. These things are really good initiatives and they're starting to happen because that's how you attract the best candidates to mm. jobs. We need our governments to be looking at these um, and not let just our employers lead the way. Yeah. Now, the current challenges for women in Australia, how I understand it, relates also to housing. And oh, yes. Yes. What is happening why is it that there aren't how why is it that you read horrifying stories about women who couch surf or or um work as uh, house sitters or yes. pet sitters and, yes i mean it's dreadful and these are often older women women of my generation um well a part of it is because that we turned housing in australia into an investment so housing became something where you made um, a, a, a capital investment and you got a return on it. So for many Australians, their major asset is their house. Mm. Now, when, and we have a system of negative gearing, which is too complicated to go in here, where if you buy investment properties, well, people who buy investment properties tend to be wealthy, um, you get support from the government to do that. So what that means is people who are priced out of the market, it also sends the price of houses up, which for people who already own houses, oh, they love that because that means on paper they look like they're worth heaps of money. But, and their major asset, we also have tax breaks when you sell your major asset. asset you don't pay capital gains tax and things like that. 
So basically we've created a warped housing market where it's no longer regarded as human shelter and a right for everyone, Mm. but actually an investment for those who are better off. And this has now come home to roost, particularly post-COVID. And we are simply, we haven't been building social housing. We followed the Thatcherite model of selling off public housing, which we had up until the 70s and 80s. And so now we're going to have to redevelop it all again, which is constantly what happens when you do stupid things like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that doesn't that takes time and it takes money. And if you won't live taxes and you won't invest in public housing, then you're going to have a whole lot of people on the street. Mm-hmm. Coming towards the end, I want to still ask you about what kind of advice do you have for women to stand up to bullying in the workplace, to report violence and harassment, or is the culture of silence too hard to penetrate? And I'm thinking particularly of those women who are young and um, who, if you like what you said before, a female who's kind of being groomed still to believe that there is Mr. Prince Charming who will come and take care of her, regardless okay. of her background. Yeah. Well, number one, no Prince Charmings out there, just blokes. Um, <laughs> but find a good one. Find one that makes you feel better about yourself. That's the, that, the only thing you're looking for in a partner is someone who makes you feel better about yourself. If you're with someone who makes you feel worse about yourself, get out. That person will never help you. Um, that's the first thing and what I taught my daughters and both of them are married lovely men. Uh, when it comes to bullying, bullying is really hard to deal with and women aren't really taught or equipped to deal with it. Um, bullying often comes out of com- competition. So when you've got highly competitive environments, that's why it thrives under neoliberalism because, um, you know, People are fighting each other to get where they want to go. There's this sort of a a ghastly ladder climbing that goes on. And being a woman, unfortunately, when there's ladder climbing happening, still remains a disadvantage. Therefore, that will be leveraged against you. That's just the way competitive um, situations occur. And that's why we need to have, you know, um, protections against that kind of thing. My advice to people who are being bullied is always the same. Bullies, whether they're doing it online, whether they're doing it in the workplace, whether they're doing it in the playground, wherever the hell it's happening, all want the same thing. Bullies want to control your feelings in a negative way. So what they want to do is transfer their pain and sense of inadequacy to you. They want to watch you feel bad. They get a kick out of that. It makes them feel powerful. Now, when someone is horrible to you and tries to humiliate you or frighten you or insult you or whatever it is, it's absolutely normal and human to feel awful when that occurs. But my advice is always never let them see that that is your reaction because that's what they want. If you can, just Don't pay attention to the content of the bullying. Rise over it. So I'll give you an example from my own experience, a couple of examples. Now, I preface this with I'm not always this clever and quick-witted and all that kind of thing. The reason I remember these two examples is these were the two times that I was. (laughs) So they remain top of mind. But... um, The first one was a guy who tried to say to me on Twitter, "Um, I'm going to come and take from you everything you hold dear. And I said, oh, when will that be? (laughs) And he said, soon. And I went back and said, lovely, I'll pop the kettle on then. (laughs) Never heard from him again. Now, the point of that is he wanted me to be afraid. I refused to be afraid or to show any fear Mm. because Otherwise, that's what he wants. Mm. The other one was when some guy got on um, Facebook, I think, and said, 
I'm a trained American Marine, and I know 70 ways to kill you with my bare hands. And I went back and said, well, that's very impressive, but surely, surely one would suffice. Um, and I never heard from him again. So the point with this is don't engage with the content and retain your own power. Too often women are brought up to give their power away to other people, to give other people the power to approve or disapprove of them, to decide that they're okay or they're not okay. That's a fatal mistake. You hold on to your own power. Never let anyone else take it from you. The only person's approval you need is your own. And the only and you're fine just the way you are. You don't have to be prettier or smarter or better educated mm. or thinner or any of the things that you're constantly told you could improve. All you need to do is know you're fine the way you are and believe it. Mm. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. It's taken me a lifetime. But even if you can just tell yourself that yes. when somebody bullies or attacks you, it helps. And have people around you. It doesn't have to be your partner. It could be friends or your parents or whoever it is mm. who can reframe what happens to you in a positive and supportive light. Do not choose negative people to be around you. Have people who make you feel better about yourself, and that's your criteria. Who cares what they earn or how good-looking they are or what they do for a living? Mm. Do they make you feel better and are more able to face the world? Those are the people you want in your life. This is what we should be teaching our daughters and, frankly, our sons too. You have a book out called The Mother. It's a domestic thriller with a moral dilemma. And I have a friend who said, oh, Lisa, you got to get it. you got to get it. Make sure when you're in Scotland, because in Sweden I can't get it. So I went to yeah. Scotland and they, they, I couldn't find it there. And she said to me when I told her, I said, I'm, I'm speaking with Jane Caro. And she said, you you got to make sure you have read the book before you talk to her. I said, well, I can't get the book. <laughs> oh, but you can, you can listen to the book. I said, I don't want to listen to a book. I want to read it. I want to feel it in my hand. But you know what? Everything that you just said now, the kind of advice, you would like to give to women that is so powerful and from my friend who who said to me it should be essential reading in schools because it has got the moral it, it has got a kind of a message that makes you think yeah it's about I always end up writing about the same thing and that is women holding on to their power or taking back the power. And the mother is very much about a woman who takes back the power. But the dilemma is, does she do it the right way or the wrong way? And, you know, if I don't come to any a definite conclusion on that. I let the reader decide for themselves. I think the one thing I'd say is we must not give up hope. Um, I remain optimistic I, I, and I take a long view. I, perhaps it's because I'm 66 now and I can see the changes that have been wrought in my lifetime and how some of them have been terrible but some of them have been really wonderful and that I can sort of feel I, I, I use a labour, a, a birth analogy as to where we're at right now in the world. It's like we're moving from one way of being human but we're in the you know, in labour, you go through first stage where, you know, you, 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 um, the cervix dilates and then you go into transition and that's when the panic sets in because the rhythm stops and, okay, it was painful first stage labour but it was predictable. And now you're in this a terrible situation where it all changes and people get panicky and really worry about it. That's when often caesareans occur and they call for the anaesthetist and so on and so forth. But if you can get through transition, you get a brand new baby, a beautiful baby at the end of it. And I sometimes think, is the whole world in transition? Are we in that panicky, it doesn't feel right, we know the word world we're leaving, it was very uncomfortable, but we know it and we don't know the world we're going to and we're in a tears? Is that what's happening? We're all screaming for the anaesthetist. I'm very hopeful that we're giving birth to a new world and I am so determined to do everything I can to make sure that it's a good new world rather than the worst of the old world exaggerated. Um, and I just want everybody else to say, yeah, that's what we need to do. 
thank you so much, Jane, for your time and generosity in sharing your thoughts. And I most certainly hope you would be happy to accept another invitation to maybe have a talk about your thoughts about education. That is an, oh, I'd love to. That is on forever an ongoing debate in Australia. I know there is a big, uh, there is a new. Um, discussion paper out in Australia, but I haven't had the opportunity to read it as yet. But we also have massive issues uh, when it comes to education here in Sweden. Yes, yes. I'm aware of um, that you have drank the neoliberal Kool-Aid oh. on, on education as, as we did, and it's um, really destructive. I've, I, I'm aware of that um, current discussion paper you know, I think it's I think it's busy work. I don't think it's yes. the core of the problem at all. <laughs> As so many of these discussion papers are meant to do. Exactly. So we can have you know, I will have read it and then I, we can have a discussion. We'll have a chat. Yes, we have a chat. Thank you so much, Jane, for your time this thank morning. Thank you. Oh, okay. no, thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, yes, uh, I'd love the mother to get published in Sweden. I really would. All right. You make sure we will do something about that. And you have been listening to the podcast Sånt i livet i Sverige, or in English, That's Life, here in Sweden, with me, Lisa Åsimäki. Till next time, take care of yourself and each other. Bye for now.